And with that, so with uh, the, the technique which we looked at that time, with uh, the symbolic transformation, you can derive the new gap equation for this hamilton. There is nothing special, you just have two bands and a different pairing amplitude in, within each band and across for interband spectrum. Interband uh, mechanism. So, if you remember for, for uh, I tell you, if you do very easy, for uh, BCS, one gap, uh, one band, sorry, you have a uh, uh, TC equation, which is like that, which is a gap equation. And uh, so here is the gap. Lambda is basically the product of this D that you had in the before times the, the, the density of space. And uh, the solution for TC is from this equation you make it when you have the gap go to zero. You will find a solution which is KBTC of this form, which is an exponential of this uh, constant. For the multiband problem that you had before, it's exactly the same equation that you multiply on both sides by delta, by the gap, and it's a matrix equation. So you have two gaps for two bands, for this space for two bands, that it can be, if you have more bands, you can generalize the straight for value. And um, essentially, so you, are, you recover here the, 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 the gaps for two bands, and this uh, captive constant, so the product of this uh, ESS, VDD, or ESD that you had before, the internal soup, Times the density of state of the final state. So, one thing which is important is that this DIT is a fluid symmetric, because they are matrix elements, but the capital constants already are not symmetric in EG because you multiply by the density of state. So, that you can solve very simply. And uh, essentially, if you call to this, this uh, uh, integral, call it a function S of the gap, delta G. Then for two bands, we have a simple matrix equation. Basically, you have uh, this, this, this equation which translates into uh, delta 1, which is a function of the capital constant lambda 1, 1 and lambda 1, 2. And that is the same. So you can write it this way. It's a matrix equation. It's, it's a kind of, of uh, you find eigenvectors. You want to find eigenvectors basically of this matrix. It's a delta 1, delta 2, to n times delta 1, delta 2. And, and this matrix. Uh, the, the matrix elements are just a product of this uh, constant on the IG times the, the integral S of delta G. So you can do the exercise, it's very simple. If you have the gap, you can expand this, if the gap goes to zero, uh, you can find the value of TC, and it will be likely to you know that for PCS, this integral is just the logarithm of uh, the cutoff that you are putting in the integral divided by KBTC. Here you will find the same solution that KBTC has the same form as for BCS, but now this capital constant is just the largest eigenvalue of this matrix. So you replace just lambda 1 1 if you like by the largest eigenvalue. So the, the nice thing to see if, if you look at it is that this largest eigenvalue is also bigger than lambda 1 1. So the TC in this expression is already always bigger than the TC you would have for just one band. Okay, because standard one, standard one, two. If this term, if all terms are positive, then this is bigger than standard one. So this is uh, very simple. But it's important because you will see that people miss points, miss some, some uh, very important things you could get from this simple equation. Till 1995. Do you miss a half in that last equation? Sorry? Because if you assume that... Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, half. Good point. <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this is how so you can solve the equation. So this iteration is very simple. And it's funny only to see that you have a different influence of this uh, interbank capping. So for this gap, for to, to, to solve this equation, I fix, for example, I suppose that in the first band you have the strong capping, let's say uh, lambda 1, 1, 2, 1, a weaker one for lambda 2, 2, so within the second band, and then I just vary the interband capping. So first, what you see is that, of course, TC always starts as just one TC, okay? and the two both caps start at the same TC, this is quite important for, for the gap superconductors. You have two gaps, two bands, two different pairing strengths on each band, but you have only one TC. 
and if, if you vary, so this is a capping constant, so lambda 1, 2, uh, essentially the small gap doesn't vary, doesn't change. In red, you have the BCF curve, but the largest gap gets slightly larger and larger. What is more funny is that if now you, you fix this value of lambda 1, 2, but you change the second one, there you have a much bigger difference in the small gap. And in particular, if this capping constant goes to zero, you will recover in almost uh, two separate systems. It is uh, when, when the, the second gap, when this lambda 1, 2, 1, that's what it is very small, the small gap is almost zero at the very beginning and only rise at the temperature. So it's as if you have a second TC. So you recover the limit of having two different uh, TC in the, in the sample when this capping constant is going to zero. Okay. That's what the other one. And so, basically, depending on, 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 the, on the mechanism you have in your system, you can have you know, gaps which look basically like, uh, like PCS gaps, or you can have something which is quite different. Now, when you have these gaps, experimentally, what will be important, of course, is the excitations. Because experimentally, this is what you can prove. This is the way you will really find the gaps in the system. And again, it will be exactly like in, in the PCS case. Well, you have two branches of excitation, one with a large gap, the other one with a, with a small gap. So this is completely straightforward. But experimentally, which, what, what is funny is that uh, you will think that superconductivity is driven by the band which has the strongest capping, which is with the band which has the largest gap. However, most probes, experimental probes, except maybe for RPS, that all the other one, we mainly probe the excitations. And, and, uh, when you are at low temperature, you put the number of thermal excitations, and usually you are sensitive to the whole, always to the smallest gap. That is, to the weakest part, basically, to the least interesting part, you would say, of the superconductor. So it is essentially this small gap that, that is easy to determine, and that you can usually determine quite accurately. The larger gap is, is very often more tricky to detect. And uh, except for our best, where, of course, you measure separately on, on, on each time surface, and when you have a bigger gap, it's much easier to see than when you have a very small gap. So where does it come from? I think the, the, the good starting point is, is uh, because between 1959, basically, and, and uh, 2001, not so much happened in this field for 40 years, especially because there were no clear examples of superconductor displaying the gap superconductivity. So regularly people were speaking of that, but it died away simply because there was no real um, good example of that. Although actually even a uh, simple lead, if you try to fit a specific heat or whatever, it's much better fitting by two gaps. Yeah, and then this, there was this big discussion with lead on Iobium also, whether it was multi-gap or just an isotropic gap. Experimentally, it will be very difficult to distinguish a system where the gap is slowly varying on the Fermi surface and you have smaller mm -hmm. and a change of amplitude. Is, is so one gap down, 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 one so the first surprise for NGP2, as you know, is that it was basically, it was discovered only in 2001, but it was a, a very common material, basically, in any chemist had that, in, in his lab, and we just were needed to, to, to pull it down to, to detect the superconducting. Moreover, it was a superconductor with conventional electron coupling, and the TC is higher than that of lambda function kappa oxygen, which was the first high TC discovered, which figured the figure of this one, was discovered maybe 20 years later or 15 years later, but with a TC higher than the transmission proposition. So it was really a big surprise. And it's uh, what is called a covalent superconductor. So essentially, you have layers of magnesium, of, of bronze, sorry, and, and, and uh, magnesium is, is playing not a big role in, in the, in the, for the, for the conduction band, except that it changes the amount of uh, electrons basically which are the different bands of the of the of the bond. And so you have this, this layers of bronze, so it's exactly. And and the, 
you have different orbitals and the ones which are in the plane which form really this covalent bonding. And you have a very good metallic conductivity in the plane. And then you have pi orbitals, which are perpendicular to the to the to the brown planes. And uh, which which makes it a real 3D system. And essentially what, what is new compared to, to other systems of that the sigma bands from, from the from the borons are not completely filled. This is due to the presence of this magnesium. And and this pi band, so you have both electrons and, and, and whole sheets. But the most important is this is this uh, covalent band, which is uh, which is right in the sigma band. The system surface is, is well determined, but it's easy to calculate also because it's a very simple system. And, and uh, people also could very easily calculate the phone spectrum. And then you have a very nice website from, from uh, this uh, people uh, where you, you, they, they, have, they show even some animation. I think. You, you can see, what, they show you what are the different uh, phonon modes which are in the system. And the most important are these phonon modes to change the length between the bones like inside this phonon uh, the plane. This couple very strongly to, 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 the, to the electrons because you change the main orbital to the sigma bands, so you change its bond uh, size. And this is what is dominating basically uh, the, the what gives you the strongest capping constant in MGB2. Okay. The pi bands, so the other ones, are the somehow the D band for Sul and Matthias, are the weakest bands for strong activity. So if you want now to, to it's, it's good to, to, to know you, you know the German surface, you know the phonon spectrum, and then, then you need to make the link between the two if you want to. to Uh, With BCS, of course, it's not sufficient because BCS is essentially a theory where, where you have uh, uh, the one parameter fluid, which is TC, but you have no way to calculate the mechanism or, or it's a very simplified mechanism in BCS. So to do that, to go beyond BCS, uh, this was done also very early after the BCS theory in the 1960s, you have the Elias Berg theory. Which really starts with real electron donor interaction and phonon spectrum. And for example, they give you uh, an, an estimate of this coupling constant that we introduced in, in the Newtonian uh, before, which is a, an interval over the whole phonon spectrum of the density of state of the phonons times an interaction density. And it's in this constant that you have really see the real phonon. <coughs> matrix element, and the density of state, also the final state. So this alpha IG, it basically contains the density of state and, and this uh, IG that you had before. But you have also the real phonon density of state, which is here. And you know also that uh, when you have electron to interaction, uh, you have also mass renormalization of the, of the electron. So this is included set consistently with the effect theory, where you have this, this uh, capping constant, uh, this, uh, renormalization factor, which is the sum of this capping uh, constant of IG. This is for T higher than TC. When T is smaller than TC, it depends slightly on the gap, but this is usually indicated. And then, of course, we need to introduce the Coulomb interaction. So, in, in simple systems where you know perfectly the thermal surface, where you know perfectly the electron spectrum, the phonon spectrum, you could dream of really calculating TC. This, indeed, you know very well. But what you don't know very well is this uh, Coulomb pseudo potential. So the Coulomb repulsion is rather difficult to calculate, and most of the time people say, well, it's between 0.1 and 0.2, but uh, it's, it's only in, in very simple systems that people start now to be able to calculate them. For MGP2, this is a three parameter, which means the calculation. And people were saying the TC should be between 20 and, and 50 Kelvin, but they could not be more. So for MGB2, if you look basically at, at the phonon spectrum, here it is, you will find that you have a positive phonon, a nice peak here. Then you have a lot of uh, anharmonic, uh, I mean, a lot of high frequency phonons, which correspond to these different uh, bone stretching uh, modes. 
Maybe if you calculate this quantity, so the, the, the real quantity which matters the superconductivity, so the interaction density times the density of phonons, which is quite different from the phonon detection. Because, for example, the acoustic mode are completely disappeared. They, they have very weak coupling with the electrons. And it's only these high frequency phonons which are coupled to the electrons. And moreover, you need to go beyond the harmonic approximation. It's, it's, uh, because you have this quantity mode which are to form a lot the, the potential. It, it happens that in MCB2, an anamonicity is very strong, and, and um, it, the, the anamonic peak in a tattoo at Longa is at a very different position from the harmonic approximation to mm -hmm. calculate. So in this compound, you can really calculate everything on the family surface, and, and, and people could, could calculate distribution of gaps on the pi band and on the sigma band, starting from really from this uh, L2 phonon uh, calculation. So there are many calculations, uh, different uh, groups we need this calculation. And, and, and uh, there is a very good agreement between basically this calculation and what has been measured and with different experiments of course. So it's a very nice case and to, where basically everything is understood. Which is quite clear. And so you can make that now connection also with from <coughs> between BCA theory and this edge back theory. Uh, essentially, in, in systems where you cannot do all these calculations which are possible for MC2, you can use a kind of simplified model where you have again the square well approximation for the potential of the BCA theory, but where you include some of the, of the basic. Ingredients of pH factory, which is namely that you will have a mass renormalization of, of your quasi particles, and you have, pseudo, uh, you have this uh, Coulomb pseudo potential. So instead of having, you will have the same gap equation as before, but this lambda EG, this capping constant, there will be now the difference between the electron point of the constant and the Coulomb pseudo potential, and moreover, they are renormalized by the, by the uh, this uh, factor of it. <coughs> so it means that uh, this matrix element will be even more uh, non symmetric, if you like, in energy, because you have this uh, normalization factor here, and, uh, and now you have also uh, this Coulomb to potential which is going to the flat. So, of course, you have exactly the same expression for TC, but using this on the bar. And if you look at that, for, for one bound, this is very close to the, the famous Maclean expression, where you replace. Uh, one over lambda, by one plus lambda, in fact, you have a three factor here, and you have to from the two star. <coughs> but this you can derive very simply from the LH pair and, and, and uh, a simplified model from the current carbon using something from the LH pair equation. I, I did that because it's, it's funny now, if you keep in mind that this lambda is here like that, for example, you can imagine that for the this Coulomb potential, potential might be stronger than the, the electron tunnel interaction. That's why, for example, some, some results don't create superconducting. But you can have a funny situation, right? for example, you have a superconductivity in one bound, and then the interbound coupling, which are negative due to this difference. Or it can be like the big tides, where the pairing mechanism itself, due to, for example, two situations, will impose that this uh, interbound coupling constant will be uh, repulsive rather than attractive. And uh, then if you look again at this gap equation, uh, <coughs> so you, you now you replace lambda by lambda by so nothing is changed. When you have solved essentially the gap equation, you can also find the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors is basically this, this gap. So close to TC, you can you can convince yourself that it, you can get very these are the equations basically. S, this integral, you can express as a function of the, of the it's just one of the, of the, of the, the biggest uh, eigenvalues on the part. And so the gap ratio, you just derive directly from the equation. They are a function of this interbound capping and the difference between the bigger, biggest eigenvalue and this uh, individual lambda 1, 1 and lambda 2. So if these two terms are negative due to repulsive interbound capping or because the quantum potential is bigger than the, than the, the, the interaction. 
what you find is that the delta element of delta 2 should be negative. And this is simply this S plus minus state. So the funny thing is that this was realized uh, by Golubov and Mazur <coughs> only in 1995. So that's the equation where uh, they were derived uh, already uh, almost 40 years before. And, and uh, so they, they realized that you can have very simply for two bond models this kind of S plus minus state. And this is due to the fact that the interbond coupling can be repulsive. If you have repulsive interactions, both bands, then you will get a uh, 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 delta 2 of the one And the funny thing is that, uh, so this, this was, this is you are close to DC, where you have exactly the, the gap ratio close to DC, which is uh, the gap ratio, but in fact, this is true uh, everywhere. For example, if you have a solution for these gap equations uh, with the given that if all the elements here are positive, and then you take the same problem where the two uh, interbond couplings are negative in the one to make the two. Then if delta 1 delta 2 is, is a solution for this, uh, for this uh, matrix of coupling constant, delta 1 minus delta 2 will be a solution for this new uh, set of coupling constants. This is just due to the fact that here, if this term is negative, this one doesn't change, it just doesn't change, it depends on the gap square. This one will change sign, so this is still positive. It's again the same, so it's a good solution for delta 1. And on, on this equation here, this one will change sign. This one will change sign uh, due to delta 2. And so you will have the same solution with delta 1 positive and delta 2 negative. So this is true everywhere. So this is extremely simple. And you can see that with repulsive interactions, <coughs> you are led naturally to this S plus minus state, which are now very popular with the P. And, and of course, you can, if, if you solve the equation numerically, you will find very naturally that you have there are these two states. And you can have even, uh, which is really, really funny, you can have even solution of these equations with only repulsive interval interactions. So that is, you can have, you don't need to have uh, positive values for lambda 1 and lambda 2. You can get both of them being zero, have only uh, repulsive interval capping. And then you have a solution which is stable within the gap equation, which is stable also within the Ginsburg-Landau function. So I think Daniel told me that uh, if we will introduce Ginsburg-Landau a little bit uh, later, more deeply. But for the Ginsburg-Landau function, essentially what happens when you have, you, you, usually you have just one term, so which becomes negative below this. So which, which makes it favorable to have a, a finite value of the gap, which is limited by a, uh, a quartic term, which is always positive. So you have, uh, when, when, even when you are below GC, you still want to have a, a finite value of the gap. And these are gradient terms that are quite important for analytic field. But if you just want to, to generalize that to a, to a multi-gap system, you will have a second term here. And then uh, a term which couples the, the two gaps. And when you have repulsive interaction, the gamma term becomes negative. <coughs> so if, if you cancel the interaction in this one, essentially this repulsive term it takes the whole of these two. And these two terms remain positive, so it's really a stable solution <coughs> of those So to summarize this, this, uh, this part, uh, I would say that multi-gap superconductivity is really a very simple extension of BCS theory. Okay? Uh, it relies on different capping strengths on, the, on different fermi uh, surface of, of your systems. And uh, due to the fact that you have interbond capping, you have exactly the same TC for, both, for, for all the systems, for all the bands. And moreover, so the, 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 what is quite important to the data is that if you have now repulsive interbond capping, this will drive a, a change of sign of the gaps between the two bands. So this is a simple uh, guide for counters. Now, an important point also was that people were often, because it was very difficult to observe uh, multi-gap connectivity until uh, MGB2 was, was discovered. And so people were also believing that when you have infinity scattering, for example, you may wash out completely uh, the, the, 
this difference between the two gaps. So it was an important point, and even for MCB2, there was a lot of discussion, and I'm not sure it won't be settled. To understand whether or not it's, it's, it's uh, we want to understand why the small gap and the large gap are, are so robust compared to impurity. Uh, so I want to say a few words uh, on, on the effect of impurities. First, as a reminder, so impurity scattering <coughs> for conventional superconductors. You have two types of impurities. Either you have uh, non magnetic impurities and you have the Anderson theorem, which tells you basically that there is no effect of, of uh, non magnetic impurities. DC doesn't change, except, <coughs> Anderson says, that you will get some isotopization of the gap. So, of course, it's quite important for your unit gap. Then the second point is that if you have a magnetic impurities, mm -hmm. then it's the applicable of Hopper theory, and, and you all know that TC will drop very fast. Typically, when the midfield pass is updated as a Korean length, TC is zero. And if you look at it, on, 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 if you look at, at what happened in the one approximation to the density of states, when you add magnetic impurities, it by it will fill the gap, and you can even end, end up with the, the gap that's superconnected. So magnetic impurity tend to kill completely superconductivity and, and they kill it by allowing the system basically to go to a gap state. Now, if you have unconventional superconductors, now for unconventional superconductors, Essentially, you have a generalized applicable the work of theory where all impurities will act as magnetic impurities for conventional superconductors and they will kill somehow the superconductivity. And this is due to the fact that because you have phase difference on the Fermi surface, any kind of scattering will, will basically uh, wash out this phase difference and so this will kill completely superconductivity. Moreover, if you look at, at uh, density of states now, what happens when you add impurities? Essentially, what happens is that, uh, depending again on the phase shift of the impurities, but the only quality system where you find information superconductors, very often you have the unitary scattering limit, and you have phase shift which are the of over 2. You get finite density of states at low temperature, at low energy, which is very often proved by my uh, experimental spectroscopy like STM, and you find zero bias anomalies or, or transport. Conduction to turn on increases states. So, in unconventional superconductors, what you need to remember is that any kind of impurities will lead to a destruction of superconductivity and to finite density of state at low energy. Now, if you, if you these impurity states, that they can be annoying, because usually experimentally you have always systems which are not completely clean, but they can be also very useful. And I think it was realized probably by Green, uh, by Peter. But we were one of the first to realize, theoretically, that you could distinguish like that uh, uh, an unconventional superconductor from a conventional superconductor which had no the gap or very small gap, but which is artificial. Or which has with no change of sign. And, and uh, the idea is that if you add impurities, if you have a, a superconductor which is conventional, let's say with, with uh, for example, gap node, but it's always this way, everywhere, when you add impurities, you will reopen the gap. Whereas if you have an unconventional superconductor, you will feel, you will add the difference at the temperature, you will completely kill the gap. And this has been observed in both carbides, in both these systems, uh, there's still a debate whether to know that they are very anisotropic gap, or that they are multiband. And at least experimentally, it was very nicely seen that if you look at a specific kit, for example, here, uh, with the pure system, you have an almost linear behavior. If you add some impurities, you start to recover an exponential behavior. So you see that in the, in the, in the, in the log scale. Here you add some significant uh, power law, and here you recover the exponential behavior. And this is to be contrasted, for example, with, with uh, two traits, where if you have a rather pure system, you have something which extrapolates almost to zero, and when you add impurities, you have a finite density of state, you have a finite specific heat, CO of T, at, at low temperature. 
So in this case, you destroy the gap. You have finite display state. In, uh, in case you have uh, conventional behavior, uh, it will reopen the gap. This is quite important because it's probably the, the only way to distinguish between S plus minus and, and uh, A state in, in the pit. And so for multi gap superconductors, well, then it's, it's uh, very, really very complicated. Essentially, there is no universality anymore. Uh, is, uh, this is only a theoretical point of view because there are lots of many experiments which are really able to, to prove that and to, 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 to my knowledge. And essentially, uh, depending basically on, on the on the gas constant, it, depending also on, on what catching of scattering you have, TC may be driven to zero or remain finite. And, and you can have also uh, very funny effects on, for the, on the density of states. So for example, this is the case where you have only lambda 1, 1, which is non zero. So you have only the first one, which is coupled. And, and all the other ones are, are, are zero coupling. So essentially, you should have uh, the density of state is a for the first one. And, and the other one is going to be coupled. When you add impurities, what happens is that you open a small gap. So basically, you induce coupling by adding impurities, and you will induce a small gap in, in, in this, in this uh, second band. And when you increase the amount of scattering, basically, at the end, you will cover just one single gap for the two bands. So in that case, impurities will just reopen the gap and, and uh, lead to just a single gap. This is the last conferency. And, and, uh, <coughs> In the case where you have S plus 1 or minus, it's even more funny because it's, the behavior is really non monotonous somehow. Here, it's, it's a case uh, where you have, so let's say, at the beginning, when you, when you, have, when you have a small scattering because you have two gaps. So this is density, you have a small gap here and a big gap here. When you add a little bit of impurities, it's like unconditional superconductor to destroy the small gap. So you have a finite density of states. But when you, you increase again the strength of the, of the increased scattering, you reopen this small gap, and to, to me at the end, you have other large gap as a single gap. So you see that it's, it's very complicated. But this kind of effect, where you first kill the gap and then you reopen, is probably a good way to distinguish between S plus minus and, and just uh, S and <coughs> So I want to stop here for the Thank you so much,
what is known by, uh, is, is the tonic spectrum. I, mean, I think people can calculate, can measure the tonic spectrum. Uh, they can calculate after that is, and, and compare basically the two gaps. For example, what is really measured are these two gaps. So this is the measure, and that you can compare with theories, which change. And the value of the gap depends on this internal factor. Then I think to my knowledge, what, is, what you can measure is, is phonon spectrum. It's, it's uh, from the surface, it's, uh, the gap, this is easy. And then if you compare the theory, you can, you can say, okay, it's the reason. For instance, could it be that that, that form, that EG form, is it responsible for interference gap in two or we don't know? I don't think it's this phonon mode, which is the, I mean, from, from my understanding, it's really the most most important for the mode to dress to, 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 to dress for my activity in the sigma bar. But for the other one, basically you need to, to, to tap out with the high bar. So uh, it's, uh, it's probably not the difficulty with, with uh, MGB2 and it's still not very clear for me that it's very anomalic. And they say I think this is uh, what I want to do. It's, 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 the spectrum is really completely anomalic. And in such a case, uh, I don't know what it means for the indeed for the for the tapping with uh with um okay. about the uh, disorder problem in the mid sides, I, I wonder if you agree that you mentioned one aspect of the difficulty in in interpreting experiments with disorder, namely that you don't really know whether a given chemical impurity is causing intraband scattering or interband scattering, how strong it is, etc. There are a lot of parameters. But another uh, problem is that all the theoretical work assumes that the impurity ask acts as a basically a potential scatterer and doesn't affect the pairing interaction. Whereas we know that almost everything we do uh, in the nictides affects the pairing interaction because it somehow affects the structure and then that is very, TC is very sensitive to this. So I wonder if you have an idea what the right way is to, to dope or to irradiate a system in order to create a system which, with, with which we can compare theory. Well, in fact, we, we have people that don't know so well, but uh, at least I know they know a little bit better. We have exactly the same problem. Which so system, sorry? Heavy Fenons. Heavy yeah, same, same, same problem. Same yeah. problem. Yeah. And, and, and uh, one big, big difficulty with this Heavy Fenons is what kind of defects do we have? Uh, they have all sorts of chemical pressures, so as you say, you change many things when you have impurities. You may have extended defects, which are even more complicated. And then the, the best way we thought would have been with what we tried to do to do with the Florent Regal Bank was to to induce some kind of point detect to see radiation. So it has a, this is a electron irradiation. Essentially, you can just move away one atom and, and create a vacancy or interstitial. Mm -hmm. And this is experimentally what seems closest to, to be uh, at least a point detect. Hopefully, if you can create it with not too much chemical pressure around. And, and uh, this would be the simplest a way to at least introduce defects, which are point defects, and, and, and uh, that you can compare easily with theory. I believe for, for high TC, Florence did a lot of work on that, and it worked rather well. For heavy segments, we tried on the uranium system, we had problems at the beginning, uh, until things were top down, so we could never really compare. Now we know how to do it, basically, and, and I hope we will be able to do it soon, but uh, we could uh, never go up to the end. But, but I believe it was the, the nice feature with that is that you can actually start from one system, which is clean, which is a single crystal, and with the very same sample you add in a control way you create it. So you can add more and more, and, and you can even uh, remove them by leaving the system. So I believe it's, it's one of the best way to introduce defects in a control way, and, and uh, where you know where, where, where you start. You don't solve everything, but at least. It's not like comparing different samples that you, where you have doped and, and already the piston sample are very really different. So this is, I think, experimentally the technique which, which, uh, which is the most appealing for me. So you need a, 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 a
All the combination is. Oh, but I think it's sometimes it will go. Now it's true that it's intuitively, I believe, extremely important. Also, they are very complex. Thank you, Shane. Oh, no, that was related to the MGB2 part. Oh, okay. Well, it, uh, yeah, so the phonon has some energy effect that can be measured directly. We saw it from that lambda can be extracted. And uh, it mainly couples to sigma band in the... And then from the collective mode, you can, you can derive the interband interaction. And it, 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 indeed, it's a, in a practical channel, you can find out the sign from that. So it is S plus, S plus. You can confirm that. And the, numbers, the numbers turned out to be right on the money with, with uh, Volvo Martin's estimates. So both for coupling to the phonon and the interband. And the coupling is indeed, so due to this interband coupling, you induce superconductivity in the second, the second year. And of course, in any spectroscopy, you can see both gaps. For instance, in Raman, you directly measure both gaps. So you don't need to do that. If you see collective mode, this is the best, what is probably most directly related to the, to the interband coupling. If you can see collective mode, which relates this is probably what is experimentally uh, uh, most directly related to interbank capital. Yeah, yeah, so this is, the, <coughs> this is a phase model here yeah, between. So this is the strength of, it's driven by the strength of coupling between the two other parts. Question? Uh, what is because you are capping between the two bands. This is basically that uh, if you like... It's basically because the Cooper pair tunnels from one band to another. I had a cartoon in my Saturday talk where I showed that. It's essentially internal Josephson coupling, as you can think about that. So the same out that is... Well, the same interband coupling that locks in the two phases. Is, is tunneling the Cooper pairs from one band to another. So it's, you can think about this as an internal proximity effect. Yeah. I would say it's, it's very difficult uh, to... Already when you put a superconductor and a metal just next to each other, it's easy to induce superconductivity in the metal which is not superconducting by itself. Okay? So now imagine that you have two bands within the same sample it would be very difficult if one one gets superconductive not to induce superconductivity in the other one. Sorry. If you want, theoretically, that the picture is, 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 is uh, this one. You see that when you solve the equation, you have always one TC. And you need to have really very weak coupling between the two bands to, to have the second gap rise only at a much lower temperature than the first one. So in this temperature, we didn't assume that they go to as the two bands go to the uh, go to superconducting state at the same time. No, you solve the equation naturally and then you iteratively and you will find that the second gap by itself it, it, it goes from the very beginning at TC. You can do it yourself and you see it's it's fine. So I think the the point is that you're solving the equation for what happens to the amplitude of the Cooper pair. Mm -hmm. If you have coupling between the bands, as soon as you solve the equation, the Cooper pair starts existing in one band, there is a finite amplitude for it to be in the other band. Right? It might be small, which means that it's easier to... Uh, it might be small, which is what exactly this plot shows. Right? But it is always there if the bands are coupled. And then as you increase the coupling, so the probability of it being in the other band increases. And that's really what this thing more or less tells you. It's true that experimentally, if you have something like that, at the point specific, you will see almost a second jump. You could think you have two superconductors here. In fact, uh, So you mentioned the example of heavy fermion materials, which are certainly multiband, but back in the old days, we weren't quite as sensitive to this. And so we sort of smeared everything out and said, we're looking at one band. And we were happy enough to deal with 
unconventional superconductivity. Uh, but now I'm interested uh, if have people gone back and tried to fit things a little bit better, and do they understand whether this coupling lambda one two is large or small in those systems? I will speak a little bit of that in, in the okay, that's fine. Um, great. Yeah. I think I'm very, very interested. Uh, I don't know if it's here. But in this case, where the company is the number of is small, can yeah. we really talk about good repairs in the second lens, or is it a proximity effect? Just there, from the strong gap, and go and take a while. Do we know an example of a material in the process? Is this kind of behavior? Yeah. Not that I know, but. Uh,
And again, take a note of this form because I'll be using this a little bit later on. So we have a D dot sigma. Sigma here is sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. The three poly matrices. And I'll also be talking about sigma zero, which is the identity matrix. And uh, so one on the diagonals and zero on the diagonals. And so I told you how you could interpret this um, D vector. And it's in principle. So the spin projections are orthogonal to D, and this means that the spin susceptibility will be unchanged when the applied field in the D vector, uh, the dot product of that is zero. All right, and so then we turn to the problem at hand, and that was what happens to superconductivity when we break inversion symmetry. And so the initial problem we were considering then was just a usual kinetic energy term, this respects inversion symmetry. We have a pairing interaction, and I took a simplified form of the pairing interaction here, which assumes no spin or recoupling, and that there's also uh, that we are also spin isotropy. Mm -hmm. And so the only place inversion symmetry broke up was in showed up is in this point here. And so we were going to derive the gap equation for this, and that was our first goal. Alright, and so I told you a little bit about how we do that. We introduce mean field theory, and then we get a uh, self-consistent solution for the gap. In particular, we get a single particle Hamiltonian. We want to solve the single particle Hamiltonian for this object here, and that'll give the gap function as a function of the gap function. And we told you how to do that. In particular, we introduce these thermal Green's functions, and then by taking the tau derivative of both these Green's functions, and then after that, going to mass of error frequency and knowing how to evaluate the tau derivative of this side, we can get equations for g and f. And that's essentially where we stopped. And I tried to rush on through to the rest. And so I'll go a little bit slower over that bit. And so the procedure I just mentioned about um, driving the Green's functions, or, or the thermal Green's functions, leads to these equations, which are known as the Gorkov equations. All right, so just so you know, these are all two by two matrices in spin space. And, they, and so I, I showed you on the previous page, I had G of SS prime. These are now two by two matrices. And so this is the G function I defined, the F function I defined. This here is the normal state Green's function, meaning the Green's function when uh, the gap is zero. And that's given by this equation here. So here's the mass of our frequency showing up. And this is the inverse of this. And again, this is a two by two matrix, but we can easily invert this. And on the next slide, you'll see the inverse of this. Uh, so we can actually find out what G0 is, not G0 inverse. All right, and so we can re-express the gap equation in terms of this F function. Uh, as you, if you remember, I had a C, C operator expectation value here that's been replaced by this. And so now what we need to do is we need to solve for this F, F function from these equations, and that'll give us our gap equation. And so what we're interested in is the linear gap equation because I want to calculate Tc. And so we only need to know f to first order and delta. And if you look at this equation here, this gives you f. And you can see that to first order and delta, I can replace this Green's function by normal states Green's function. And so my f will then become g0 delta g0 transpose. This means transpose, incidentally, and this means Hermitian conjugate. And so if you look at what I wrote down for the gap equation, it looks very much like that. I have a G0, I have a delta, but notice I have a sum over this index S1, so that's like matrix multiplication. And then here I have a G0 transpose, this S2 is in the other spot. So you can see where that comes from. And this is what we're after. We have the gap equation now, and so now we're going to look at that in a little bit of detail. All right, so here's the gap equation. On the previous slide, I told you how we can find G0. We have to invert this 2 by 2 matrix. And when we do that, we get the following. We get a diagonal part in spin space, and then also uh, the three poly matrices, GX, GY, and GZ, showing up, or the G, yeah, the sigma X, sigma Y, and sigma Z showing up here. And then we get uh, what I call G plus and G minus. Important point to remember is that G minus vanishes as alpha goes to 0. Because I have a minus sign here, and alpha goes to 0, G0, zero G minus will vanish. And so we know this, we know this. And then for the gap function, we just introduce a singlet part and a triplet part, just as before, but we allow both of them to coexist. All right, and so then we can substitute all that into this equation. We can deal with all these spin sums, uh, which takes a little bit of algebra, quite a bit of algebra. But in the very end, you end up for the singlet component with the following equation. So that's really our first result. 
We have our singlet component here. It's coupled to the singlet component and also to the triplet component. And so you see right away that you do get this singlet triplet mixing happening. And you also notice that in the coupling term, you have this G minus. And so you can see that as alpha goes to zero, this term will disappear. We only have singlet, singlet coupling. And so this mixing does appear because of the broken inversion symmetry. All right, to go on further, uh, a standard approximation is to take this sum over k and then replace it by an integral over energy and an average over the Fermi surface times the density of states of the Fermi surface. And the reason we do that is because I mentioned earlier that this interaction B is only valid near the Fermi energy. And so to a large approximation, we can take this density of states with some general dependence on energy out of the integral and make it the density of states at the Fermi. Yeah? Is that the, I mean, what are the limits on this integral? Because they look funny. Oh, sorry, that's there. just my, yeah, this, is, this, this is meant to be an epsilon cutoff, but the oh, C okay. is not a subscript, it's just a big, Fine. yeah, Fine. it's not a subscript. All right, and so that's a standard approach within weak coupling theory. And so I'm not going to go into the, you'll see what happens in the next slide after we do this. I won't go into the details of that. So I pointed out that there's singlet triplet mixing. What I'm going to do now is look at the, the case when we can ignore the singlet triplet mixing so we can look at TC for a pure singlet case and TC for a pure triplet case without spin orbit interactions. And then later on, we'll go on to introduce what happens when we do have singlet triplet mixing. All right, so let's do that first. And so now there's a fair amount of algebra to be done, but I'll just give you the results because you get some idea of how to do this. So first for the spin singlet case, well, this is the, this is the TC when we have no spin orbit coupling. This is the TC with spin orbit coupling. And you can see it's changed by a factor of the order of the spin orbit coupling divided by the Fermi energy squared. And this is going to be a small parameter in many materials. Not always, but for the materials of interest, it is a small parameter. And so the conclusion is that spin singlet superconductivity is not really changed, or at least the TC is not really changed by this uh, broken inversion symmetry. Now the spin triplet case, and I mentioned this result already yesterday, but I didn't go into the details. The spin triplet case is different. You see here we have a correction that depends on alpha, but doesn't depend on epsilon f. And so in particular, TC is given by this expectation over the Fermi surface of this F of rho of K times something in front of it. The important point here is F explicitly written. It depends on TC itself. And so we have TC here and TC here showing up. And this is TC without spinorbit coupling. And the important point is that once this prefactor is non-zero, then TC is very strongly suppressed. And so the in realistic cases, when this parameter becomes very, very large, the only possibility to have a, 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 a TC for spin triplet superconductivity is when this prefactor becomes zero. And there's only one solution for what, when, when this happens. And I mentioned this yesterday, that's when the G vector and the D vector are parallel. So when this term exactly cancels this term. And so the result is that for spin triplet superconductivity, broken inversion suppresses superconductivity except for one so-called single protected D-wave vector where G and D are parallel to each other. Right, and so let me just show you that in a little bit more detail on the next slide from the case of Rashba spin orbit interaction right here. Here's the expression for TC again. And so now I want D and G to be parallel to have no change in TC, and that's this case here. Here the D vector is parallel to the G vector, and that's this line. So this, these are unchanged. Now we can look at other possible spin triplet states. And we can see that for this case here, we get the following suppression. And notice the energy scale. This is essentially the spin orbit interaction divided by the gap. And so once this becomes very large, you can see that TC is going to be very strongly suppressed for this case. And for this bottom case here, you see it's very rapidly suppressed. And so the conclusion from this analysis is that really, in the presence of strong spin orbit coupling, only one type of spin triplet state can survive. All right, so that's your first result. It's a little difficult to verify that experimentally um, because you have to be able to probe exactly the symmetry of the order parameter. And so now I want to turn on to something that you can verify experimentally. And that is, uh, you, I want to do the same equation with a finite field. 
uh, which is, uh, and for spin sigma superconductors, this is uh, adding a Zeeman field, and then the field is destroy superconductor is known as a Hall field. All right. So just to quickly review that, here's the Fermi surface without Zeeman coupling. Here's the Fermi surface with Zeeman coupling. And we want to make a spin sigma Cooper pair. We see we have a problem because the up and down spins are on opposite uh, sheets of the Fermi surface, and so we cannot make the spin sigma pair so easily. There's a finite kinetic energy cost associated with pairing here and here. And so what happens then is when we apply a Zeeman field, we find that once uh, the strength of the Zeeman field becomes on the order of the gap, then spin sigma superconductivity is suppressed. And that's known as the Pauling field. And so we get a suppression once this is about on the order of delta. And this is well documented, seen in many materials. Here's something, so here's an example from, from, from the um, iron arsenic family. And you can see that this is what you would expect if there was no, uh, no poly suppression. And here's what's actually here if there's a strong poly suppression. Right. And then conversely, spin triplet superconductivity, if there is no spin or recoupling, is not affected. And so if we free spin rotational variance, then the same field will not change. If there is spin or recoupling, of course, spin trip, it will be affected, but I won't go into the details of that right now. All right, so what happens in the case of the non central symmetric superconductor? Well, again, we have to now calculate Tc as a function of h, and so what's different from before here is I've added this new bh term, and now you can go through the whole calculation the same way as before, and you find one key result. And I haven't written down the expressions because they're pretty long and they're not so intuitive, but this key result is easy to understand. So you, when you find that the g vector and the h vector, their dot product is zero, so for a Rashba case, the g vector lies in plane, the field, say the field along the c-axis, so perpendicular to that, then you find that the Pauling field diverges at low Tc. And this is true for a spin singlet superconductor. And so you can see that spin orbit coupling dramatically changes what we expect for these kinds of physics. All right, and here's the expression. And let me actually go into um, show you that in some more detail on the next slide here. So, uh, so the Pauli field for spin single case is strongly suppressed, and I've shown that here. So this is the this is the um, Pauli field as a function of temperature for various spin orbit couplings, and the spin orbit coupling is essentially measured in the gap energy. All right, so if we have no spin orbit coupling, you get the usual Pauli field, and that lays somewhere around here, and that's when, it, that's when uh, again, as I mentioned, H, mu B H is on the order of delta. But now if we add spin orbit coupling, so twice delta, you get a significant enhancement already, six times delta, 12 times delta, and though I haven't shown it here, there's actually formally a divergence, but that divergence is very weak and can be destroyed by many things like impurities and things like that. But you can see clearly that if we have uh, a spin orbit energy scale that's much, much larger than the gap, then this Pauli field is very strongly enhanced. Uh, for the spin triplet case, it turns out that the, um, the Pauli field is, is unaffected by, there is no Pauli field for uh, G parallel to D. So the spin triplet case is, uh, is like before. All right, so <coughs> we have a prediction that we can actually compare to experiment. And I should point out that we hadn't realized when we did the work, but this had already been pointed out by Bulyaski in, I guess, the 1980s. And so we really looked at this problem back then and we showed the same result. So here's the experimental results. This is a plot from Q. Kimura in, in 2007, where he measured the upper critical field of a non central symmetric heavy fermion material. And so he also plotted on this path. So here's the measured critical field at zero temperature versus the Tc of the material. This line here is what you'd expect for the poly limiting field. And then the do red dots here are all uh, non central symmetric materials of the Rashba type. So they have a Rashba spin on the cup. Right. And what you see is that many superconductors are clustered here. There are a few that push above, but you can see that all the non-central symmetric superconductors do sit above this line, and so the Pauli field is enhanced. And he also found this particular material, which is what this paper was about, where not only was it enhanced, but it was significantly enhanced over the Pauli field. So the Pauli field would lie somewhere down here. And he varies pressure, so he gets a range of critical fields as a function of pressure. And it turns out that he's tuning near a quantum critical point to get this high upper critical field. 
So here the origin of the critical field at zero um, temperature is in fact determined by vortex physics, not by politics. Yeah. How was this HC2 determined? How was it determined? These are transport measurements. Um, so I have to go back and look in details for exactly which ones. But um, yeah. yeah, because in some cases it's the amplitude of the gap that gets suppressed. In other cases, it's the phasing, right? Yeah. Um, and that would be very different. That's true. I mean, the phasing usually matters if you have very, very short coherence length superconductors. And while heavy fermions are short coherence length, they're not often as short as, say, the coupe rates. And so, I mean, it's a valid point indeed. Um, but the point is, I mean, really the critical observation is that we do exceed the poly field. And so this prediction seems to be borne out well by experiments. Question? Yeah. The field here is perpendicular? Yeah, the field is perpendicular to the, plane. the, yeah, the four, it's parallel to the fourfold symmetry axis in these materials. I was always under the impression that um, the orbital effects are the ones that yeah, yeah. are so, perpendicular. That's right. So here, the orbital effects are responsible for the HC2 that's observed. So these dots are orbital effects. But because, again, heavy fermions are relatively small coherence like superconductors, the orbital effects are not as uh, significant as many other materials. And so the orbital effects are in some sense suppressed as well, the orbital fields are pushed up. So, how do you say that uh, G should be a particular temperature? I mean, if you have, yeah, yeah. If you have orbital effects, then G probably would be like this one. No, no, G is a, it's a rational spinner recoupling. So, the, 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 if you remember, it's x hat ky minus y hat kx, yeah. so it lies in the plane. And so the field is along the fourfold symmetry axis. Ah, so, so G is not along Yeah, G is not along Z, G is in the plane. The symmetry broken axis and the G are different, right? Because yeah, that's you right. showed this, that if I have, the, let's say, N along this, and N cross K is the one that gives you G, yeah, right? Yeah. And that one is perpendicular to the, uh, to the axis. Uh, comment, so HC2 orbital, though roughly speaking, is effective mass squared. Nominally, Pauli doesn't depend on the effective mass. So for heavy fermions, you expect HC2 orbital to be high. Normally, Pauli would kill it, but here it doesn't. That, that's yeah, so actually, uh, Mora's main point was that this is, in some sense, the highest critical field ever seen. <laughs> in some sense, <laughs> relative. <laughs> So that's, um, that's one uh, calculation where there's some, actually that's the calculation that has the best success in terms of um, the field of onset of superconductivity. So now I want to turn to another experimental observable, and that's the spin susceptibility. And I'm not going to go through the details of the calculation, but just point out that Gorkov and Andrew Kosov derived this expression in the 1960s for the spin susceptibility, and we can just use it here. All we need to know are the Green's functions, G and F, and I showed you that we can calculate those. So we know G and F, we can put them in here, we can actually calculate this. And so it's a, a, a matter of a, of, a, of a bunch of algebra to go through this, a lot of algebra, but it is really a matter of algebra. All right. And so here are the two main results that come out of this analysis. So for spin triplet superconductivity for the protected state, so the d vector parallel to the g vector, you find that this is independent of the spin orbit interaction. All right, that's not a particular surprise if you think about it a little bit. However, what is interesting is that for spin singlet superconductors, you find that the spin susceptibility becomes the same as the spin triplet case in the limit that the spin orbit coupling becomes much larger than delta. And so this means that you cannot use spin susceptibility to determine the difference between spin triplet and spin singlet when you have uh, broken inversion symmetry. And so that's a, 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 an interesting conclusion to come out of this. And in the case of the Rashford attraction, Gorkov was actually the first to point this out. Um, so there's a very nice physical explanation of this by, by Yip in this paper here. And so he gives a very simple elementary explanation for why this is the case. Uh, I think if I have time at the end of this lecture, I'll go over that or give a sketch of that, but I'm probably going to run out of time. So if you're interested to see why this is the case in the case of alpha special action delta, I strongly recommend you read this article. Actually, very, it's, it's nice to be
Right, so let me just look at that in a little bit more detail. So here's the, uh, this is for a, a rash specimen orbit interaction again, right? And so here, again, I'm plotting the susceptibility as a function of T. This is for the field along the C-axis. This is zero spin orbit coupling. Now we have um, spin orbit coupling that's twice uh, KBTC, six times KBTC, and you can see that very rapidly you go up to what you expect with spin triplet case. So with spin triplet case, you get no change in susceptibility for the field along the C-axis. And for fields in plane, you go down to one half the value. For fields in plane, it's not possible to have H and G, the dot product, be zero. One half of the dot product is always along uh, H in some sense for fields in plane. And then this is also, this is for fields in plane, what you get for this case, and you find the susceptibility approaches the one half value that you get in the triplet case as you increase the spin orbit coupling. So here's zero, here's two, here's six again. All right, so that's just re-emphasizing that point that uh, the usual nice of measurement is not really useful in distinguishing spin singlet and spin triplet superconductivity in the presence of uh, broken inversion. All right, so let's check how this does in comparison to experiments. And there isn't really a lot of data to compare to, but this is serum, serum iridium silicon free, which is also which is a rash with spin orbit interaction, and you can see it does okay for the field along the c-axis. Uh, you predict no change, and it looks like there's no change. For the field in plane, you expect to get actually to about here. So this is what you get for a singlet superconductor. Uh, they assume some finite residual density states in the material for reasons I haven't gone and carefully looked up. Uh, but you expect to get half this value. So you expect to end up around here, and you still find that the in plane is over what you expect uh, from prediction. But this actually happens quite a lot when we make predictions about susceptibility. So for example, in strontium ruthenate, for fields along the c-axis, it was predicted that the spin susceptibility should be suppressed, but in fact it's never been seen to be suppressed. All right, so there's still some work to be done there, but it does qualitatively okay in terms of uh, this. All right, so now I want to change gears and Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. So I've emphasized in all these um, uh, calculations here, I've only really emphasized the field along the four-fold symmetry axis. And there's a reason for that, because it turns out the field in the plane for Rashba interactions is very interesting. And I'll talk about that in the next lecture. Right? And in fact, this kind of analysis doesn't really apply in that particular case, because there's some new physics that shows up. All right. Um, so how much time do I have? Eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. So I have enough time to get to this last point. All right, so before I was talking about the weak spin orbit coupling case or and ignoring a lot of singlet triplet mixing, and as we was pointed out yesterday, in principle, I shouldn't work in the spin basis, but I should work in a band basis. And so now I want to go to the strong spin orbit limit and actually work in the band basis. And in the band basis, what you get then is you get two Fermi surfaces, and in principle, you should have two gap functions. And so this becomes a two-band system, much like what was discussed in the previous lecture. And just to give you an idea of how you go from the spin basis to the band basis, I've just written down the interaction, and because I'm not considering strong spin orbit coupling, I'm not making all those assumptions I made before about the spin interaction showing up in the interaction here. I'm allowing this in principle to depend on spin, so it's not, I have assumed no spin orbit coupling here or spin isotropy. This can depend on all the spin possibilities. But what you can do is you can go from the spin basis to the band basis by simply rotating the spin. All right? So in the original basis, I've taken the spins along the z-axis, but I told you the spins are parallel to uh, g plus and minus g. And so you can rotate from the z-axis to plus and minus g, and that's just this unitary transformation here. And so now I can re-express these two operators in terms of the band basis operators, and I'll get some pairing interaction that depends on 1, 1, 2, 2, for example, and then 1, 2, 1, 2. But I'm just going to tell you right now that I ignore any possibility of interband pairing. So having a Coop, having an electron pair, uh, so having a Cooper pair that's formed from an electron here and an electron here, I ignore. I only allow the possibility of having here and here. And also I'm going to consider only the case of the S-wave singlet, just for simplicity, combined with the protected spin triplet state. All right. 
And so, how do you what? I mean, just you just adjust the media in the Here, yeah, you'll see. I'll show you. Yeah, well, actually, it's already in post here. I'll tell you why. Um, so this. Since we're allowing for a general spin interaction and I'm restricting to S wave uniform singlet and protected triplet, you can write down the pairing, the most general pairing interaction allowed for that. And that includes, uh, so this tau major, that, these, these tau's uh, correspond to the spin dependence. And in particular, I have a singlet interaction with no K dependence. That's my usual spin singlet Cooper pair that we have. I have a triplet interaction where D is parallel to G, so that includes this term and this term. And then because we broke an inversion symmetry, in principle you get a mixing between singlet and triplet at the pairing interaction level. And so I've written that down here, though I'm not going to include this explicitly in the next slide. I'm just going to drop it because it makes things very messy in terms of the equations and this. You won't be watching the slides at all. Um, so what we do then is we just simply take this singlet triplet uh, uh, interaction, put it into here, take care of the spin sums, put these new basis functions here, allow for a two band superconductor, and just calculate away. And then we get an effective two band superconductivity matrix with four elements. So this is pairing on this band, this is pairing on this band, and then this is Cooper pair scattering from one band to the other, just given here. And so here I dropped the, uh, the um, mixed single triplet case. So all this analysis, in the end, gives you the form of delta 1 of k and delta 2 of k. And a little bit of thought, you can see that this is the answer. It has t times the spin triplet part plus or minus psi. And this is the important result that come out of this. You get two different gaps. And in particular, because generically this g is k dependent, you have some k dependence to the gap, and then your usual s wave singlet is, is uniform, so you have this uniform. And this is going to give rise to the possibility of nodes in s wave Cooper pairs, and so I'm going to go over that in the next slide. But just so that you understand this result without all these calculations, actually you can just look at the picture and see exactly what's happening. So here I've just drawn a couple spins in red and a couple spins in blue. And so here, if you look at the red spins, I'm pairing these. But you notice that this pair is one half a spin singlet and one half a spin triplet, right? Because up, down, minus, down, up is spin trip, singlet. Up, down, plus, down, up is spin triplet. And so the corresponding other half of the singlet or triplet must lie on this other band, and it does. And so if I want to make a spin singlet Cooper pair, then if I have a psi on this side, then I want to have a minus psi on this band. And that gives me my spin singlet, up, down, minus, down, up. And correspondingly, if I want to make a spin triplet, then I want to have up, down, plus, down, up, and that gives me my spin triplet part that appears on both. And I told you the spin triplet d vector has to be parallel to the g vector, so its magnitude must be given by this. And so this result is relatively easy to understand just by looking at this picture, and you can see where it comes from. And so even though I went through all these calculations, you could probably have written this down right away. All right, so what does this mean? Well, let's look at cerium platinum 3 silicon. And let's just assume that um, we have this protected spin triplet state. And in fact, early on, some people did think that because the measured critical field was above the poly field. They said, okay, it's spin triplet. All right, so let's look at this. Now, cerium platinum 3 is not two dimensional, it's three dimensional. And so, the crudest approximation is Fermi's sort of sphere. It's not so critical for this discussion. But the point is that the G vector is still given by this. And so, in the plane, so when kz is 0, I've shown you this picture many times. But now if we think of the kz dependence, and so here I set ky to 0, then at the top and the bottom of the Fermi sphere, we find that this g vector vanishes. All right. And in fact, that's a result that comes not just from the simple analysis, but it's a result of symmetry. The g vector must vanish at the top and the bottom of this spherical Fermi surface. So when kx equals ky equals 0. And that tells you then that if this is indeed a spin triplet superconductor, and if this, and then, and, and we are in the protected, um, we're in the protected spin triplet state, then we predict here that the gap function must have point nodes, right? So it vanishes here and here. And what's seen experimentally? What's seen experimentally is uh, here I've plotted penetration depth data that I showed you before. And here's thermal conductivity data. As a function of field, but we're interested in the zero field value, both of these are consistent with line nodes, not point nodes. 
Right? And so is there a way we can understand that with this possibility of having a spin triplet state? Well, there is from spin singlet state triplet mixing. And so in particular, here's what I just mentioned before. If we now allow for the possibility that we also have a spin singlet component, then you can see that the spin triplet part has to go as the magnitude of sine theta. Sine theta is a polar angle, so it vanishes here and it's maximum here. Right? But now you can see what happens. Because we have both possibilities for the sine of psi, one of those signs is going to have to give you nodes somewhere. And so the nodes will lie somewhere around here, but you're guaranteed to get nodes for an arbitrarily small spin singlet state. And so here's a situation in which you generate line nodes from point nodes by mixing in the spin singlet components. All right, it's not, so there are, there are other experiments that sort of support this picture, but it's not very strongly supported in the platinum research. Though people, many people do this as a possibility. All right, and then the other example where this was proposed was in the context of these uh, d electron systems. And I, here I plotted some band structure results from Warren Pickett. And so, in particular, how am I being for time? Okay, this is my last point. So, All right. so there's two classes of material. Here's the palladium material and the platinum material. This is the band structure for palladium without spin orbit coupling. This is the band structure for palladium with spin orbit coupling. And as you can see, you do get these splittings of the bands that I talked about due to the appearance of this G vector. And the platinum material, again, this is the band structure without spin orbit coupling, the band structure with spin orbit coupling. And you see you get the splitting of the bands again. But if you look at these two pictures, you see it's much bigger for the platinum case than for the palladium case. And the other thing, I want you to notice is if you look carefully as you move around the uh, move along these bands here, you see that the spin orbit splitting is anisotropic. It's smaller in some regions than in other regions. And so G of K does depend on momentum. And so it's not uniform. And so using the fact that the spin orbit coupling is larger here than here, we suggested the possibility that what's happening in um, in these materials. If you, if you follow the first lecture, I showed you penetration depth measurements where for the palladium material, it showed a fully formed gap. And for the platinum material, it showed line notes. And what we suggested was that, in fact, what's happening is as you increase the spin orbit coupling, you're getting this mixture of singlet and triplet, but the triplet component is growing larger. And so eventually, you do get the possibility of getting notes. And here's a qualitative picture of that. Here's a small spin triplet component. You, in essence, get an anisotropic gap. Here's a much larger spin triplet component, and you get these little line nodes here in this S wave superconductor. Now, this is really the only evidence for this picture. And again, this picture is not so strongly supported by other. I mean, it's. I mean, this. The appearance of nodes is not strongly disputed, but there's the origin of the nodes is not strong. So, so there are many other possible explanations for that. The nice thing about this is in both cases, this falls in the S-wave superconducting class, and so it's consistent with the idea that you expect electron polar mediated superconductivity in this material. Right, and in fact, that's the point I would like to stop and then open this to questions. Thank you, Andrew. Questions? So, uh, in, in this material, because it's D-wave, uh, I think the idea that uh, you know, spin orbit is much smaller than all the other cutoffs in the system is certainly true. Yeah, the DLC except, DLC. except delta, right? It's bigger than delta, smaller than everything. Yeah. In heavy fermions, I've always struggled with the, with the idea of whether spin orbit is actually smaller than what we would normally call the Fermi, because that's sort of a moving target, right? I mean, I have somewhere the cutoff for the heavy fermion behavior, and that can be it. Of the, of the same order? Mm -hmm. This is a good question. Yeah. Um, I've struggled with the same question, and so the answer, I think, lies in looking at the experiments. So I think the experiments there do show you that the spin orbit coupling is bulky. There's still much larger than the gap. Uh, I and I guess there must be... Um, so in principle, you can look for two Fermi surface sheets using the Hasenhoffman experiments. And I think in the context of um, some of the heavy fermions, Onuki has done this, and he has seen uh, spin orbit gaps, and they are typically uh, a fraction of the Fermi energy. They're not comparable to the Fermi energy. So does I Fermi energy measure? Uh, you know, this is basically yeah, what yeah, Fermi yeah, energy, yeah. what we call Fermi energy in heavy Fermi. Right? Yeah, this is yeah, where yeah. rho becomes t squared, or, or, or yeah. this is something that is related to the volume. Okay. Now this is the yeah. This is 
before you have the heavy fermion corrections actually. Right. So it's for respect to that fermion energy. So it doesn't really, so that gives you an idea. So you can look it up and see. So maybe, in fact, it can be quite large. Okay. I believe you have seen this nice data community. They were taken on samples which are not broken uh, up. Yeah, okay. they're still heavy. Yeah, they're still heavy. Yeah, very heavy. Heavy. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think for some reason, it's silicon. It's not clean enough to succeed. To, to see the GSC yeah, that's, that's true. Unfortunately. But I think to it's answer that is very nice to speak in some of this. Yeah, that's right. And that should be enough to answer the question. Shall we go back to your. Uh, interaction in the band basis? In the band basis, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here. Yeah, so um, the first time, the V interaction, no, but let's go back, Daniel, let's go back to the first time here, VSS prime, here. KK prime. Yeah. So you're writing that in the orbital basis now? This is in the spin basis. Yeah, so but these are yeah when you say the band basis, I, I thought the band phase is meaning that you are diagonalizing your kinetic time. Yeah, that's right. Exactly right. Yes. So when you're writing the interaction, let's go back to the microscopic interaction that you write in orbital basis. Yeah, okay. So, I mean. Then, then the interaction most of time, I mean, unless it's a local, if it's local, it's a constant. Yeah, you mean this interaction here, or...? No, I mean that the first interaction that you have, like if you go back to the microscopic interaction, such as the Hubbard interaction or Hunz couplings, those are local, so you don't even have... Um, you have some interaction which will be CK at a, some alpha, because you have two bands now, so you have to come from at least two orbitals, say X, Y, So the two bands come just from spin. They come just from spin. So we have a single, a single band from the mm -hmm. principle some sort of band A function, which has some band dispersion. We haven't specified what that is. But because the spin orbit coupling breaks the twofold degeneracy that into two different spin channels, the two bands here do come from spin. So we don't need to worry about the, the um, well, so we don't worry about so much about the orbital part. We're really focusing on the spin part. But you're right, you in principle should consider. Um, yeah, because especially when you're talking about these uh, examples where you had XZ and YZ and then PZ orbitals. If you go back there, then X, Z, Y, Z do couple together because there's a sine K, X, sine K, Z, and then your interaction will get all these momentum factors. Yeah. So it um, becomes much more. It comes on, yeah, this is a simplified model. No, I agree. I mean, if, as long as you're not close to any band crossings, then you can say to a large degree you have some sort of banding function, and that's described by some band. And so as long as you're not close to band crossings, this should be okay. But in practice, I've shown you band structures. There are many band crossings, and so we should indeed include many orbitals. But what we're focusing on is really the spin dependence and how that changes things here. But that's a good point. I apologize for coming back to the question, but do you know of any examples where the chemical potential is below the Dirac point? Uh, Oh, so you mean where the dispersion you is, have oh, I understand, band. oh, because you, you're looking at the crossing coming in, so you're looking at where you have a single band. So yeah, that's oh, your picture, you're basically cutting off one of some, you know, it's like one boom. Yeah, so the, the one possibility is something I mentioned in the first lecture, and that's the surface of the topological insulator. So there's a case where you may have this possibility, um, but other than that, I know of no no case. Uh, so that's the closest you could come to. Uh, so I haven't looked at this in detail because most of the considerations we're interested in is really the spin orbit is much smaller than, uh, than the chemical potential. So we're not so, we haven't looked at this case in much detail. I mean, the metallic interfaces, you're getting closer to this limit, and so they're interesting for that reason. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but in the double axle insulator, the curvature, you don't have, it doesn't come back. Right? Yeah, I know, it doesn't come, come back. back. So I know it's a little artificial, but um, so I don't know of any particular. I mean, maybe you can look at all these bands and find some place, some particular band, or some band structure where this might happen. What about the platinum and platinum that you are showing us? Do you have any, like a single band? You mean you want to look? I'm going to try looking pretty up here. 
No, no, no. The later on, you have shown us that the uh, yeah, what was that? Medium flash. Yeah, yeah. So you want to see if, if it happens uh, anywhere else? I went the wrong way. Sorry. Yeah, you're going back. To yeah, sorry. Yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you want to see if it happens anywhere here, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused about something pretty basic. Uh, you started uh, by describing the system you wanted to study with the Rashba term. Yeah. And that's parameterized by some coupling. But um, supposing I wanted to think about a system. Uh, which has no spin orbit interaction in the Hamiltonian at all. I just have a singlet pairing interaction. Yeah. Uh, and then I introduce a surface. Yeah, okay. Now, that's going to break inversion symmetry. That's true. And it's going to give you spin uh, singlet triplet mixing, I think. Yeah. And so it, I, I'm wondering to what extent it's equivalent to what you've done and how do I calculate alpha in such a situation? I, that's a great question. Uh, so. What I would suggest is you could introduce it as some sort of um, surface spin flip scattering, perhaps. And that would be maybe. Actually, Ilya, you, you, you did calculations of this type, no? Well, we did a calculation for the surface with no spin orbit, but I think the difference is that because it's a metal, spin orbit at the surface will be screened at the Thomas Fermi length. Yeah, I mean, that's so a good point. So it will so come it exactly as Daniel says, as the boundary condition. So you can introduce spin flip processes at the interface, uh, and that means the spin will not be conserved, and, but there will be no triple component in the bulk. Whereas what is suggested in these talks, that there is a bulk property that satellites the triple component in many situations, be, simply because you can't have just singlet. Yeah, the coherence length is just too big to, yeah. for this to be relevant for the bulk property. So, so the one is what breaks? Surface breaks inversion symmetry by definition. I have something on one side, I have something else on the other side. Sorry, I don't, no. Surface breaks, breaks inversion symmetry. In simple language, look, inversion symmetry is wonderful. The Rajba basically tells me that my, my surface is charged. My surface is charged. Yes, it does. Arthur says so. I thought the question was that is that enough to break the inversion symmetry so, yes, without spin so coupling, wasn't it? Yeah, so the answer so would, let's be, would be large sort of bulk properties. So, uh, yeah. so the answer to that. No, of course not, but, but near the yeah. surface you'll have a, a layer. Yeah. And so, and yeah. Now that's something, like I said. Well, but that, but that's with at atomic distance because it's a metal. No, you s well, okay, yeah, you could say it's on atomic distance. It's, but it, it, it's atomic distance. These, these kinds of effects have been seen in, in uh, solutions of of degen equations, for example, near, near surfaces where you... Yeah, I mean, uh, it, but it, it, it's a yeah. decay. But it's a very yeah. rapidly decaying. Okay, yeah, that's that's true. Rapid yeah. decay. It decays yeah. at KF. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it might affect, uh, for example, uh, the ARPES experiment or something like that. That's true. Okay, so that sounds like there is still room for coffee discussion, and then look at the results in the end. So, let's turn it down here again. And we recently, I believe, that we love and thank you for your We argue, but we ultimately quit business. The first reaction is always no. Not that far off. You know, you can stop this. So.